So with this video we're going to go over some of the new HTML5 form changes. Many of these changes revolve around new attributes created for the input element. So let's dive right in. So here we have a basic form element and the action is set to a non-existent PHP script. We also have an empty input tag. So let's add a type to the input tag. Let's start out with something fun like color. So here we've added an attribute type with a value of color. If we open this up in our browser, you'll see that it creates a color palette for us. In the past, this type of functionality would have required JavaScript, PHP, or some other programming language to achieve. Now this functionality is actually built into the HTML specification. Now, if you notice, the default color is black. We can change that, and the way that we change it is by adding a value attribute and placing a six-digit hexadecimal color as its value. So here's an example. And now the default color is orange. The date type acts as a date selection widget. So let's take a look at it. So here in Google Chrome, you can see that it defaults to a date entry field. And we have month, day, year. And we can select our month, our day, and our year. We can also click this little arrow, and it opens up our selection widget. And we can choose any date we want. If you want to scroll through the dates, we can do that as well. And if we want to set today's date, you just have to click this button. Now this just happens to be the Chrome implementation of this widget. Other browsers may implement it differently. If you would like to set a default date to our widget, we can do that as well. And there's our default date. Setting the input type to a value of month is similar to setting it to a value of date. The only difference is with month, the output is limited to the year and the month. An input type with a value of time allows us to restrict our form field to time values. So let's take a look. So here's our input field, and we can change the values if we like. If you would like this field to have a default value, you can use a military time format. So right here, if I would like this to be 1 p.m. instead of 1 a.m., I have to set it to 13, 10, 22. An input type with a value set to week is similar to an input type with a value set to date, except the input form is restricted to a week and a year value. So let's take a look. So there's our week, there's our year, and it's a similar widget to the date widget. And if you would like to set up a default value, you have to use this format, so the year, dash, and then the week of that year. With an input type of email, a form is set up to receive an email as its input type. So let's take a look. Looks pretty similar to any other form, but if I type in a non-email input and hit submit, you'll notice that Google Chrome actually throws an error and it says, please include an at symbol in the email. And when I do, the form goes through.
Now an input type with a value of search is semantically used to tell the browser that this form field is intended to be used as a search field. Now it doesn't actually have any built-in search functionality, but there is one small feature to it, so let me show you what that is. If I open this up in a browser and I do a search for something and then go back after submitting it and type in the search again, as you can see it remembered the search. The range type allows us to create a virtual widget slider with min, max, and a step value. So let's take a look at it. So there's our slider. And as it stands, I don't actually have any attributes set to it. So let's go ahead and do that. So here I have a min, a max, and a step. The min is at 0, the max is at 10, and the step is at 1. And what this does is it allows us to constrain the range of our slider and then gives us a value by which we can increment through that range. So here we go. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. An input type with a value of tel is a form field intended for a telephone number. However, if the user types in a value that is not a telephone number, there is no built-in error checking. You can still submit the form. However, there are additional HTML5 attributes that allow us to do that type of checking. So I think this is a good time to discuss some of those now. Pattern allows you to add a regular expression to input elements, hence constraining the user input to a specific pattern and character set. In our example, what I've done is I've taken the input type of tell and I've added a pattern that is a regular expression that constrains the input to the format of a US phone number. So for example, if I go to our form field and I randomly type in some values and hit submit, I get an error that says please match the requested format. If I do just that and match the requested format and hit submit, the form goes through. Autocomplete is an attribute that you can use to autocomplete form entries. It has a value of either on or off and to see it in action you'll need to submit a form then refresh and type in a similar query. So let's see that now. Autofocus is simply an attribute that lends an automatic focus to a form field on page load. So if we open up this page, and if we look at it in the browser, you'll notice that the form field is focused by default. You can tell by the blue highlight, and that's all it does. The no validate attribute allows us to bypass the built-in validation restrictions of certain input types. If you recall, the email input type only allows us to submit an email in the form. Otherwise, we get a warning message. So let's take a look at that to refresh our memory. So since this isn't an email, I get a warning message. So now we can turn that off with the no validate attribute. and the form gets submitted. The placeholder attribute places light text in the backdrop of a form field. This is useful to give the user an idea of what the form is intended for. In our example we have the placeholder attribute with the text type your name assigned to it and if you look at the form field it says type your name in the backdrop. The required attribute simply inhibits a form from being submitted if it's empty. 
So if I click the Submit button, I get a message asking me to fill out the form. The form method is nothing more than a way to allow input elements to override their encapsulating form elements method attribute. So if you look at our example, we have a form element and it has a method of post. Inside of it, we have an input element with something called a form method and it's assigned to get. Well, the input element's own internal form method takes precedence over its encapsulating form elements method of post. Form ink type is the same attribute that was previously only available on form elements. However, it is now specifically available on input elements. This attribute simply determines how forms are encoded when submitted. The default, if none is specified, is the one that we're using in our example. The only reason to change this is if we're uploading files, and in that case, we can use the string multipart front slash form dash data. Form target is the same as the target attribute that was previously only available on form elements. Now it's available on input elements as well. As you probably recall from HTML4, this determines where the new document will be displayed when the user follows a link. The four values are underscore self, underscore blank, underscore parent, and underscore top. And these are all HTML4 values. If you have an input element of type file, the multiple attribute allows you to select multiple files for upload. So for example, If I hold down Shift and select multiple files and click Open, the output acknowledges that multiple files were selected for upload. The data list element and the list attribute work together to create a data set that a form can pull from and list automatically when it's being used. So for example, in our code we have a data list with an ID of cars. We then have a list of option elements, each with a value set to a different car type. This is then hooked to our input element via its list attribute. So if we do a search for any of the information inside of the data list element, including all of the options with values of various cars, that information should appear in the form field. And it does. The progress element is a widget style progress meter. It's typically used to express the time delay between dynamic form activities such as the submission of a form or an upload file. So here's the basic code for the progress element and what it looks like when it's launched in the browser. The progress element has two attributes. The first is a value which determines the current value of the progress meter and the second is a max attribute which determines the maximum value of the progress element. The meter element is a display element similar to the progress element, except it is not intended to express progression. It's intended to express a known range of values. The meter element has a min, max, and value attribute. Additionally, it also has high, low, and optimum attributes. The low value is a range that is considered low, the high is a range that is considered high, and the optimum, as the name implies, is a range that is considered optimum. The output element is used to express the output of a particular value. This is usually used in conjunction with JavaScript code, where the output of a form value is expressed through the output tag. In summary, you should now be familiar with the various HTML5 form elements, as well as the new input attribute types. You should know how to create many of the widgets demonstrated in this lesson, as well as understand what they are used for. Until our next lesson, bye-bye. 
If this is your first time here, click on the subscribe button to get similar videos every week. Every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, new videos are uploaded to our YouTube channel. If you want to see similar videos, click on the links under Check Out These Tutorials by Simon Says It.